my name is Alyssa Cantarudi. I'm particularly interested in the unique needs of female and endurance athletes. This talk is about RED-S, which stands for Relative Ener Energy Deficiency Syndrome. You might have heard of this syndrome by its previous name, which is the Female Athlete Triad. I trained as a family doctor, and now I'm getting some extra training in sports medicine as a fellow at the Allen McGavin Sports Medicine Clinic in Vancouver. In order to understand red S, we need to understand and recognize that our bodies have a finite amount of fuel to carry out the functions we need to keep us alive. Uh, most simply, this is broken down into baseline metabolic rate, physical activities, and something called the thermic effect of food. To say the thermic effect of food means um, the energy required to digest and process food. You could imagine that for an athlete, the blue physical activity slice of this pie can become disproportionately large. When we have athletes that do not have enough intake or fuel to sustain this output, we see something called a low energy availability. If this low energy availability is sustained, the body is not able to continue with the red section, which includes all the functions required for normal health. It begins to divert energy away from processes here, and red S is the clinical syndrome we see as a result. So you can think of red S as an imbalance between intake and output. I want you to consider for a moment that the reasons your athlete has decreased or insufficient intake are highly variable. We'll get to this in a later slide. I want you to think also about the various functions your athlete's body has to perform. We know that when athletes are under stress, they are more likely to slip into red S. I mentioned before that we first named the syndrome the female athlete triad when it was described in 1992. That triad included amenorrhea or lack of periods, disordered eating, and osteopenia or decreased bone density. Since then, physicians and exercise physiologists have begun to recognize that low energy availability is related to more than menstrual function and bone health. This is a figure from the most recent IOC consensus statement on red S. The primary features of the triad are included along with a range of other systems. Uh, as we continue, we'll explore more about how these processes are affected. But for now, you need to know that athletes who have insufficient intake can present with a wide variety of complaints or concerns. So realistically, what does an athlete with red S look like when they present? And the answer is it depends. Uh, I like to break down the red S symptoms into categories, performance, mood, and illness. Um, if athletes are aware that any of these may indicate a medical problem, they might come to you about it specifically. However, many athletes don't realize that their mood disorder or recently decreased performance or inability to focus are actually something that they can ask their doctor about. Something that's important to remember is the idea that an athlete can be operating at a relative energy deficiency while maintaining his or her weight. If we think back to that first pie, the body is shifting around how it spends the energy, but it's working very hard to uh, maintain normal processes. So don't fall prey to that um, tempting assumption that if your athlete's not losing weight, they must be normal because that's not the case. Uh, so how do we define an energy deficiency? In order to understand whether an athlete's getting enough intake, we need to ask ourselves how much they need. Uh, in reality, this number is likely a little bit different for each athlete. Uh, but the general agreement is that this magic number of energy availability should be 45. Uh, every athlete's EC, or cost of uh, energy, is going to be different based on their unique situation. Uh, this means that their intake can be different as well, as long as their availability stays at or above that magic 45. 
we measure energy availability in kilocalories, which are the same calories you think of as being printed on the back of a cereal box or a McDonald's menu. Uh, and then we account for a person's size and the time frame we're looking at. So we need an energy availability here of 45 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. As you can imagine, in the clinic, it's not always easy to estimate the values for this equation, and you might find that it's difficult to calculate whether or not your patient has a low energy availability based on this alone. Um, but remember that red S is largely a clinical diagnosis, and this can often be confirmed with some investigations. You might find that uh, a sports dietitian can help you assess your uh, athlete's intake. There's also a variety of methods for assessing fat-free mass. The gold standard is DEXA. We'll come to that later. Precisely though, determining the athlete's energy cost often requires a physiology lab. Um, and there are some equations I've included here. These are the Harris-Benedict equations, and you can use these to try to approximate the energy cost. But I do encourage people to try not to get too caught up in the numbers. Okay, so now we'll get into some physiology. Let's talk a little bit about what's really going on with reduced energy. So this is the familiar diagram of hormonal relationships during the menstrual cycle. Uh, remember that the whole thing is started off by the hypothalamus secreting GnRH, and that tells the pituitary to make LH and FSH. FSH and LH act on the ovary to increase production of estradiol, which has a positive feedback effect. Eventually, LH and FSH peak, triggering ovulation. The egg continues to produce progesterone, which decreases LH and FSH production. If no pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum dies, progesterone levels fall, and menstruation occurs. But in a low energy setting, the hypothalamus loses its ability to regularly secrete GnRH. And this means the pituitary is not stimulated to produce enough LH and FSH. The ovary then does not make as much, as much estrogen and ovulation does not occur. Without these hormones reaching their peak levels, there will not be any menstruation. You might also see an athlete who is experiencing oligomenorrhea or periods less than once every 28 to 32 days. And that can be an indicator of low energy availability as well. I want us to take a moment also to refresh our memory of why estrogen is important for bone health. We talked about it in the last slide as being very important for regular periods uh, in women, um, but it's also important for bones. And so through a variety of mechanisms that you see here, estrogen stabilizes osteocytes and increases in the production of osteoblasts. Remember, Osteoblasts B for building up bone and B for blast, so osteoblasts help us with building bone. Osteoblasts and T-cells, which are also stimulated by estrogen, help to decrease the activity of osteoclasts, which are involved in bone resorption. So, um, in some people, we have regular menstruation as a helpful marker of normal estrogen levels. Many people have looked at whether or not menstrual dysfunction or a low estrogen can cause permanent bone loss. Uh, this figure is from a study that's a little on the older side, but they are looking at bone density in the lumbar spine and femoral neck in athletes who were previously oligo or amenorrheic. The athletes were tested twice, approximately seven years apart. Athletes in the RR group had always had regular periods, so regular and regular. Athletes in the ROA group had had regular periods at time one, but they had a history of some dysfunction. Athletes in the OA group never had regular periods. Uh, at time two, all of the athletes in this study were menstruating, and that was either because of uh, oral contraceptive pill use or because their menstrual cycles had recovered. And so what you can see here is that initially, having a history of menstrual dysfunction correlated with decreased BMD. But we can also see that even though the women in those groups resumed menstruation, seven years later, they still had decreased BMD relative to their peers. 
And this is very, very important because it means that if you have a young athlete sitting in front of you, not only are there implications for being uh, for their bone health, for being amenorrheic at that time, but we need to appreciate that there are potential implications that may last significantly longer. Recently, we've also seen some data published uh, that immune function seems to decrease with decreasing body fat. And so this figure is from a paper looking at self-reported illness rates in athletes as they headed into the Winter Olympics. You can see that athletes in leanness di disciplines were more likely to report a higher exercise load and an illness during the training period. Uh, in this graph here, we see a similar effect reported in elite cross-country skiers. Uh, they were asked to report any illness that occurred in the 10 days after their peak competition. Uh, they were compared to training partners who did not compete at the same event. And so what we see is this J-shaped curve. As athletes intensify their load, they may be increased at increased risk of illness, especially uh, URTI. Uh, okay, so sometimes it can be hard to convince the athlete in front of you that they need to increase their intake. Uh, this table I, I quite like. It's from a systematic review published in 2013. It looks at the results of short and long-term dietary restriction on, on disordered eating, and it found that athletes who maintained these habits had consistently poor performance compared to their peers. And so sometimes I find that if I have an athlete in front of me who says, you know, it's really important for me to maintain this low weight because I need to run faster or row better or whatever it is, I show them this and I try and use it as a tool to say, okay, but taking in a little bit more fuel can actually be more helpful. Uh, here we have examples from two papers that look at injury risk and disordered eating. Uh, so you can see that for high school athletes with disordered eating, the adjusted odds ratio is uh, 2.1 for injury, and in that case, the relative risk is about 1.3. So that's the link to any injury during the season with disordered eating. In the second paper, we see that athletes are more likely to report a major injury if they have dietary restriction, menstrual dysfunction, or a low BMD. Once the female athlete triad was expanded to REDS or RED S, we started to look for cases in male athletes as well. Uh, some papers suggest that prolonged intense endurance exercise can have a similar effect on male reproductive hormones. Uh, in the second paper at the bottom down here, uh, we see that male cyclists, who as a group are known for you know, having a pretty intensive program and some functional overreaching being the norm, uh, will operate at a significant energy deficit. This paper looked at average energy intake and expenditure at a six-day training camp, uh, and it found that the energy availability for these men was actually negative. So you can imagine how, um, if this is just a representative sample, then they're constantly in this sort of negative energy availability. Uh, obviously, that doesn't bode well for them. Okay, so now that we have a few examples of physiological changes, we can look at who's primarily affected by red S. And the short answer is any athlete. Uh, practically speaking, though, we can look at some groups that are at higher risk. So endurance athletes need to move their bodies across a long distance as fast as they can. And this means finding a balance between enough muscle mass to be strong, uh, but light enough to not waste effort. So sports like endurance running, triathlon, cycling, rowing, all big ones. Uh, the other group is athletes involved in aesthetic sports, and they're also at risk because of the constant attention to their appearance. And so here we think of athletes like gymnasts and divers. Um, and finally, we have athletes who are required to meet a weight requirement or uh, compete in a weight category and may severely restrict their intake, especially in the short term just before a competition, 
to do so. Um, and you'll come across athletes that have multiple risk factors, such as bodybuilders, um, who are judged both on appearance and may also be required to uh, meet a weight category. Uh, okay, so we know athletes who are at risk of reds. The question is, how do they get it? The main problem, and the one that needs to be fixed to get back into energy balance, is getting the appropriate amount of food or fuel in for the amount of energy output. I like to think of disordered eating on a continuum. At the most harmless uh, end, you have an athlete who's well informed with their dietary needs and who is intentionally and slowly losing a small amount of weight. Uh, in my experience, elite athletes are within 10% of their ideal weight throughout most of the year, um, and this isn't that group. So moving along the risk continuum, we have an athlete who is under eating without realizing it. Slightly more risky is the athlete who is accepting some risk and under eating for a short period of time for a performance gain. You might think of this as a marathoner who is working towards a race weight. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about ways that this, there might be safe ways to do this um, in the next slide. But finally, as we get kind of into this risky red end of our continuum, we have athletes who have subclinical eating disorders um, and those who have full-blown disorders that meet DSM-5 criteria. So knowing where your patient falls along this continuum can help you know how worried you need to be about them. And again, I really strongly encourage you to involve uh, a team at this point, including a sports nutritionist and a sports psychologist. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about um, weight in endurance athletes. As the spotlight on REDS continues to grow, some people do feel that the medical and scientific communities have become too worried about undereating for performance. Um, and so this is a sort of case study about Hilary Stellingworth. She's a Canadian 1500 meter runner. The graph shows her body fat throughout her professional career. Every star represents the lowest body fat percentage of that season. She's had a very consistent career. She's run between 405 and 408 every year between 2005 and 2016, except when she was pregnant. Every year, she brought her body fat down to a low at her peak event and then allowed for a recovery in her off season. She's never had a stress fracture or any menstrual dysfunction. Of course, she's an N of one, but it's interesting to see that a well-informed athlete might be able to safely and deliberately uh, cycle their intake to briefly optimize performance without sacrificing health. Uh, and so according to this little case study, which is published by Hillary's husband, um, she accomplished this by maintaining her intake during her off season and then slowly adding a deficit as she headed into competition. She also structured her food throughout the day so that she was able to eat more during and after workouts, uh, and she increased her protein consumption to avoid muscle loss. Some programs, especially universities or high-level athletic organizations, have begun to incorporate some screening for athletes before the season starts. Since screening is relatively new, there's some debate as to its utility or what the best tests are. I've noted some good papers here uh, for you at the bottom of the slide that are good resources. Anna Mellon and her group, who are from Scandinavia, have published a fair bit about markers of low energy availability, and their latest research suggests that you may be able to use a combination of blood work and a questionnaire called the LEAF Q to help you assess an athlete's risk of REDS. Uh, I do want to note that the leaf cue is only validated for uh, women. Uh, this chart's actually a little bit old, and Anna's paper goes more into detail about the biochemical markers and the leaf cue. Leaf cue stands for Low Energy Availability in Females Questionnaire. Uh, it's 25 questions long, uh, fairly good sensitivity and specificity, so 78% sensitivity and 90% specificity in female athletes. And then Margot Mountjoy's group has just written a paper that is not quite published, uh, but they tested elite female athletes before and after five months of training, and they used a leaf cue cutoff of greater than or equal to eight to label an athlete being at risk. Uh, so which athletes to screen and when to screen them is still something we need to establish, as well as 
sort of how to screen them, although we're kind of getting there. The IOC recommends pre-participation examination for all athletes, which means that screening for red S should at least cross your mind. Uh, if you notice one component, like menstrual dysfunction or increased illness frequency, it should really prompt a more thorough review of the other factors. These are kind of my top screening questions for athletes, but I'm not sure if I need to be worried about red S. They're not really scientific or properly validated. Um, they're what I'm kind of working on so far. I also see, uh, or I ask if I see an athlete uh, during their season, if they have increased injuries or uh, I'm seeing them frequently for URTI, uh, it tends to kind of pop into my head. So let's try and decide if this patient here could have red S. So it says here we've got our 23 year old male rower. He's coming in feeling really fatigued, can't really hit his targets in his workouts. And you ask him about his diet and what he's been eating in the past few days as an example, um, and his regular exercise sort of patterns. And then you estimate that he's spending about a thousand calories a day on exercise. His total intake is about 2,860 calories and you know previously that his weight is 60 kilos and he's got 10% body fat. First thing is to think back to your equation. So the EA, energy availability, equals energy intake minus energy cost. And before we can calculate the energy cost, we need to know his fat-free mass. Because remember back to our slide away in the beginning, how we calculate all of this energy availability as being available per kilo of fat-free mass. So we know his body fat percentage is 10%, so we know the other 90% is not fat. So 0 0.9 times 60 kilos is 54 kilos of fat-free mass. Now we know that the energy availability equals energy intake, which he gave us, it was 2860, minus the EC the cost, which we know is 1,000. So that leaves us with an energy availability of 1,860 kilocalories per day. We need to compare this or divide it by fat-free mass. And so we do 1,860 divided by 54, and that gives us 34.4 kilos, or calories, sorry, per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. Remember, back to that slide, we know that our energy availability should be somewhere around 45, that magic number. So if our athlete's only getting 34.4, he likely has a low energy availability. Once you've decided that an athlete's at risk of red S, how do you actually make the diagnosis? Of course, the first answer in medicine is always to take a thorough history. It's very helpful to ask a sports dietitian again to help you get a sense of the athlete's dietary history. It's probably helpful to have, you know, have them bring their coach or some training data um, or whatever you can use to help you estimate their energy expenditure. This is sort of a brief list of labs and other investigations I might order in a patient who I'm worried about. Uh, I'm just less likely to order the investigations in italics, mostly because of the mixed evidence for them, um, but they are included in some of the literature, uh, and I don't often find that they're clinically relevant, except for perhaps in advanced cases. I want you to remember that if you're working up a patient for red S and they have amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, you should not assume that it's because of red S. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, I'm not going to go through this entire workup right now, but I just want to remind you that you really need to rule out other causes of amenorrhea uh, in a female athlete, especially pregnancy. Uh, it's totally fine to ask for help from endocrinology or a gynae if going beyond ordering a beta HCG is more than you would usually do. Um, but I just also want to sort of have you thinking about a wide net that you're casting and then narrowing your diagnosis from there.
Uh, so moving on to our investigations, the suggested guidelines for bone density testing in premenopausal women and men is based on clinical risk factors. I order a DEXA if the patient has one or more of the major risk factors or two or more of the minor ones. Uh, I'd suggest that bone density in this population is probably understudied and that you should have a high index of suspicion that athletes presenting with red S have bone density issues. Uh, in a patient over 20 years old, you need to ask for a spine, total hip, and femoral neck measurement. And for patients under age 20, they should have a whole body minus head scan. Uh, you can use the results of your first DEXA that you get to guide any need for future scanning. Okay, so now you've identified your at-risk athlete, you've completed your workup, and you've made a diagnosis. How should you treat them? Uh, remember that the inadequate intake is at the heart of red S. So you go back to your screening tool, your leaf cue, and your sports dietitian, and help you understand why your athlete's intake is low. If you feel they don't have disordered eating, they might just benefit from education. However, if you feel that your athlete has disordered eating or has gone so far as to meet TSM-5 criteria, they need to be referred to an appropriate setting for management uh, because you want to restore that healthy balance. Generally, you want to see your athlete slowly gaining some weight or increasing their body fat. While they're recovering from red S, they also really need to decrease their energy expenditure. Um, and it's really helpful to incorporate CBT in cases where intake is disordered. So lots of good evidence that CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy um, is more effective than either uh, medical treatment like with an SSRI or uh, nutritional education alone. Uh, be careful in athletes with documented low bone mineral density or BMD. Unfortunately, maintaining a normal weight does not necessarily mean that bone mass is adequate. So most of the studies in this case unfortunately are on young females with anorexia and I don't think the two populations are exactly perfectly comparable. But the take home message is that you can expect the athlete to recover in a stepwise process. First, they'll return to energy balance if they increase their intake. Then you can expect them to regain normal menstruation. And then thinking back to our earlier talk of amenorrhea and osteopenia and those potentially prolonged effects, they may be able to recover their bone mass. Um, but how much recovery is possible is really dependent on how depleted the athlete is how long they were suffering from red S and how old they are. You may choose to supplement your treatment with pharmacological options. There is evidence for SSRI use in disordered eating, but these are still more effective with some kind of behavioral therapy. Generally, I use fluoxetine, which has good evidence for use in eating disorder and is one of the better studied agents in young people. When it comes to menstrual dysfunction, as we talked about before, there's some question about whether or not hormone replacement with something like the OCP actually improves bone health in the long term. I think you can definitely think about OCPs in patients where they are otherwise indicated. So symptoms of low estrogen, such as like vaginal dryness um, or a desire for contraception. I think that if you're otherwise at the end of your rope and there's no contraindications, you could try them um, in athletes who have continued menstrual dysfunction even after they've increased their energy availability. I'd caution you though against using them in athletes who you are still worried about um, and because if you induce a period in them, you might mask ongoing problems. I also want you to remember to treat athletes with low BMD as well. So if they're osteopenic or osteoporotic, they really should be seen by an endocrinologist who has expertise in this area. Uh, all athletes should optimize their calcium status through diet. And in general, in Canada, almost everyone will benefit from vitamin D supplementation. I usually suggest that women beyond 2000 I use daily. <laughs>
So now that you've treated your athlete, how do you know when you can get them back to sport? Um, I think this is really important. The taper is from a table that's put out by the Female Athlete Triad um, Coalition, and they suggest assigning patients points based on risk factors. Their categories are energy intake pattern, BMI status, menstrual status, age at menarche, uh, bone mineral density, and history of stress fracture. So you assign your athletes the points, and then based on the total number of points, you can assign a degree of risk. Remember that some athletes might recover quickly, and some can take quite a long time. So you can use your clinical judgment to help guide your follow-up timeline, but I think starting with shorter intervals tends to be better. Um, okay, so then we also have something called the Red S Cat. Uh, the Red S Cat was developed by Dr. Mountjoy's group, uh, and they suggest um, triaging uh, athletes into high-risk, intermediate-risk, or low-risk groups using a red light, yellow light, or green light system. This assessment tool is really helpful. It's available online. Um, and see the uh, groups highlighted here at the bottom. So the recommendation is that high risk or red light athletes uh, are not to train or compete. And I recommend using a written contract with the athlete. Yellow light athletes may start to train as long as they follow the treatment plan and you need to see them in regular follow-up. As you see the athlete beginning to recover, you can clear them more and more to compete on a case-by-case -case basis in this category. And finally, once you give the athlete the green light, they can fully train and compete. Uh, I still suggest that if you have an athlete who had red S and now has the green light, that you see them back at least once or twice to ensure that they continue to do well. Uh, and so here we have a practice question that I was thinking you could think about um, to see how you, what you would do in this situation. So we've got a 21-year-old female triathlete coming in for um, pre-participation examination. There's no prior exam on file. Uh, her weight is 90% of ideal. And sometimes you'll see this instead of a BMI calculation, you'll be given sort of a, a percentage of the ideal weight. And you can interpret this one as your athlete is a little bit underweight. She had menarche at age 13. She's had eight periods in the last 12 months. And she's now been amenorrheic for the last two months in a row. She does have a history of three previous stress fractures but she denies any disordered eating or depression. She is concerned about her weight as it relates to her ability to perform. So I want you to think about nine additional history questions that you might ask. They might ask about if her weight has dropped recently, how much, if it's been intentional, um, if there's been any change to her training load or recent changes um, in what she's doing overall. You can ask about her dietary intake, if she's ever had, remember education on nutrition is really important. Is this a lack of awareness or is it intentional under fueling? You might ask about her coach. Is she under pressure to lose weight or reduce her intake or is she um, inappropriately increasing her volume too quickly? Has there been a change in her performance? Is she struggling in her workouts to hit her paces um, or has she performed worse in a competition than she might have expected? Uh, and finally, you might ask her what age uh, she started specific training. So there is some evidence that the earlier you begin sport-specific training, the more at risk you are of injuries down the line. Uh, and then you kind of want to get a sense of what's going on with her stress fractures here. So uh, were they all on the same site? Were they high-risk fractures? How was her recovery? Um, has she had other injuries along the way? Really like flush out that history a little bit more. Uh, you might ask about uh, fatigue or insomnia, both symptoms of red S, uh, and then frequent infections. So all of the risk factors we discussed kind of previously in the presentation.
uh, some more sample questions here. So you can list eight investigations that you might order to start. I've given you some there that I would go with. Um, and what would you do if you would involve any other health professionals? I love my sports dietitian and sports psychologist. I almost always involve them in cases where I'm worried about red S. Uh, and then when do you want to see her back? So in this case, I suggest seeing her pretty quickly to review the results of her investigations uh, and get the opinion from the dietitian and sports psych. Uh, and then you can decide from there what you want to do based on her risk factors. You can flip back a few slides and have a look at that again if you need to. Thanks so much. This is my contact information. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, that's it.